Okay, so uh, I want to present before you Oli. Um, Oli is going to discuss with you uh, about ransomware today. Uh, and we've got three different lectures about ransomwares. They will approach different uh, vectors of actually how to look on, on ransomwares. Um, and Oli is leading our threat prevention and cyber products uh, management and uh, marketing in Checkpoint. Uh, so Oli, go ahead. Now? Yes. Good. Okay. Um, so, good morning, everyone. And today's uh, entire day, is, as uh, Nitan was uh, saying before, is dedicated to ransomware. Uh, and um, ransomware has been on the news for a long time, but really uh, it's gotten a lot of hype and a lot of attention over the past month and certainly over the past two days. If you've been reading the news about cyber attacks, you might have noticed it was a major outbreak. We'll give you a little bit of an insight about what... Uh, What's behind this plague? Why is it really happening and why is it uh, proliferating so much in the recent times and some insights and then the rest of the sessions will give you more technical details in particular about the recent attacks and about other elements and aspects of this uh, entire world of ransomware. So let's get started with this session that, that will try to give you the broadest background of, how, uh, of what's behind this ransomware plague as we call it. And they promised me that this thing works. Here it is. So first of all, let, let us start off with something more general. Imagine a world where criminals would have access to superpower weapons. That's a very scary world. Think of a criminal that would have access to a nuclear bomb, to uh, missiles, to all sorts of things. Well, in the real world, we kind of know criminals do not have access to superpower weapons, right? So we're not that afraid about the amount of damage that they can do. But in the cyber world, they actually do, and let's look at things that have happened. Uh, two months ago, NSA cyber tools were leaked. Those are uh, very strong, powerful, superpower weapons. We don't tend to think of it that way because it's just pieces of code, but really these are weapons. A month later, this is what happened. We've seen the WannaCry massive outbreak. WannaCry was so massive because it was using the NSA superpower uh, tools. Um, tools. Two days ago, we've seen another massive outbreak. This time we call it Petya, and it's also using the same tools from the NSA. It's also using other methods. We'll talk about it in the, in the next sessions. But it's, uh, but it's also using those, those NSA tools, and that's what makes them all that effective. So cyber criminals are actually using superpower weapons. Okay. Every day, and if you think this is the only one, get yourself ready, because last month, earlier this month, actually, the CIA cyber tools were leaked. So it's only a matter of time before we see an attack that's actually using them. We don't know when it's going to happen, but we know it's going to be very, very powerful. Because when nations create cyber attack tools, they do a very good job, more than the average criminal does. They have really, really smart people working on creating those weapons, and they really are weapons, whether we like to think of them this way or not, because they can shut down an entire country. Certainly, they shut down uh, many major factories. 
So it's all of these tools that get leaked, we think of it as hacktivists, we think of it as people trying to better the world, the Snowdens of the world, but they can e eventually lead to major outbreaks and major damage to major p uh, corporations and facilities. So this is what's truly happening today in the world. And the latest two attacks, as I was saying, are actually uh, using ransomware in order to wreck havoc. This is what they're doing. Uh, they're using ransomware to paralyze organizations, to paralyze uh, companies, shut down their, uh, their uh, facilities, shut down their uh, plants. This is what's happening in the last two uh, outbreaks, which leads me to talk about, let's start, let's go backwards and discuss what is ransomware. So what is ransomware? We start off by saying, uh, here is the dictionary uh, definition of what is ransomware. It's a type of malicious software that's designed to block access to a computer system until a sum of money is paid, okay? So it's a way for me to block access, whether to your file or to your actual system or to the control of your system in such a way that you would be so devastated or you would need that access back uh, enough so that you would be willing to pay me a sum of money to get it back. Not that different from ransom in the uh, physical world where somebody takes something that you have or threatens to publish something that you don't want to see published and asks you to pay money in order to avoid that particular incident. So we need to ask ourselves, is it just another type of malware that gets a lot of PR, or is it truly the biggest cyber threat today? I think what we've seen in the last uh, month with those two outbreaks is that it's more leaning towards here. Because we've seen major companies and major places get completely, like I said, shut down just because ransomware was uh, involved and nobody was able to get their data back and everything was uh, either paralyzed until they can recover from backup or completely lost for good. And let's ask ourselves three more questions that I will try to answer in today's session. First of all, what is feeding this ransomware plague? What's more to come? And lastly, what can we do about it? Those are the three questions that I will try to answer. And of course, let's start off with asking ourselves, okay, what's feeding this ransomware plague? And for that, I'd like to take you to, uh, to uh, the other side of the world. Let's take a look at how ransomware looks from the cyber criminal side of things. And let's look at it through a fictitious event that we kind of call the uh, cybercrime experience, where we welcome you to the future of cybercrime. Let's take a look at what the future of cybercrime looks like. So first of all, we need to acknowledge that these are truly great times to be a cyber criminal. Cybercrime is booming everywhere. From every different angle that you look at it, cybercrime is continuously evolving and continues to be more and more lucrative to the people that are involved in it. First of all, we see more product lines, if we can call it that. More ways to attack companies and make money out of it. We see more customers, again, if we can call them that. More people that are getting infected. Even though our security keeps getting better, more people still get infected because the, uh, the attack tools are becoming more sophisticated. We see more innovation across the board, whether it's through use of, of like I said before, superpower uh, um, tools that get leaked or through innovation coming from the cybercrime industry uh, in itself. We see more revenues, con continuously more revenues. Cybercriminals are making a lot of money and the more money pours into cybercrime, the more people Smart people are going in that route because they want to take part in this. And lastly, we see even more press coverage. Uh, if you open the news two years ago, cybercrime was kind of a niche thing. You would read about it maybe page five, page seven, uh, if we still have pages still in this internet age. Uh, so somewhere in the small print today, it's headline news. Yesterday, every news outlet, why not for people in Israel, headline news was about the cyber attack in the Ukraine. And this is what we see all over the world. The press coverage is uh, getting much, uh, much more uh, in-depth, much, much stronger than it's ever been in the past. Here are some examples for this press coverage, uh, things that I've collected over the past year, uh, and, and just random things, because you can really open up the newspaper, open up your favorite uh, website, and you will find headlines that talk about ransomware and cybercrime in general. Ransomware found in the Dutch parliament. Skype users that were hit by ransomware. These are the two known ones, the WannaCry ransomware from last month. Losses could reach $4 billion. It's actually probably more than that. And then uh, this one from just two days ago, new ransomware outbreak, 
looks similar to the WannaCry that was before shutting down computers worldwide. Ukraine was the first hub, but then it spread from there uh, to the rest of the world. So let's talk a little bit about the strategy behind this. Why are people going towards ransomware? Why is the cybercrime industry leaning towards ransomware, whereas in the past it was using a lot of different tools? This is how it looked like in the past. We used to see things like spam worms, key loggers, bank intrusions, botnets, and all of these are still very valid tools for cyber criminals, except there's one thing that they have kind of in common. This is what you're getting from them. You're getting things like credit card details and medical records, financial data, intellectual property, data records. That's the key part of it. And it turns out that if, you're, uh, if you have uh, the data breaches, tend to leave you with the data, whereas in fact what you're looking for is the money. They leave you with the data and not with the money, and then you need to monetize it. And monetizing breach data is not as easy as one would, expect, would hope. If you have a stolen credit card, making money out of it is limited. There are many fraud detection tools that are employed by the credit card companies. There are many. Uh, the credit card will be revoked at, at, uh, pretty soon. Maybe if you do a uh, transaction that's too big, that would be flagged as well, and you wouldn't be able to get it uh, done. So there are, uh, monetizing that breach data, of course, for the other types of records, it's even more complicated. It's not as easy as we would want it to be. So we figured out, as cyber criminals, that there actually is a better approach to getting money out of crime. Which, uh, again, the cyber crime, we call it an industry because that's what it is. It's an industry designed to make more money, much like the drug industry. Okay? So there is a better approach, and we call this approach ransomware. And the concept of ransomware, why would I look for somebody to buy someone else's data? That's risky. That's difficult. Where would I find somebody who's interested in that company's data? You know who's most interested in, their, in this data? The owners of the data. So if I can sell the data back to its owner, I'm in heaven. This is where I will get the most money because everybody needs their data. We kind of try to, to take a look at it from a, a fictitious, again, magic quadrant where we try to lower our risk to the minimum and to uh, increase our revenue potential to the maximum. So you always want to be in the magic quadrant at the top right corner. And this is exactly where ransomware would be if you were to look at it from this perspective. How would I minimize my risk and maximize my revenues? Ransomware is the answer. If you're a cyber criminal, it's the easiest, fastest way to get from crime to money. Let's look a little bit at the numbers, because the numbers are really staggering. These are 2016 numbers. We're now midway through 2017, so I can guarantee that the numbers in 2017 will be significantly higher. But numbers in 2016 are impressive enough, so let's uh, look at them a little bit. First of all, 40%, 40 of organizations were infected. That's an unbelievable number. And that's an organization that were infected. Sorry? Worldwide, yes, 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 of course. Everything I'm showing here is worldwide. 40% of organizations were infected. That's an amazing number. And keep in mind, that's infected. I'm not even talking about attack, because attack, it's probably close to 100%. There are very few organizations that wouldn't tell you that somebody tried to penetrate one way or another and um, infect them with any type of malware, for sure, and with ransomware in particular over the past um, month. Here's another impressive number. 70% of the infected organizations actually paid. Now, the numbers that we see when we look at individuals are significantly smaller. There are different reasons that we can, uh, uh, to, for us to explain why individuals don't tend to pay as much. Either they don't have the money or it's very difficult for them to figure out the mechanism for paying, which involves some digital currency, etc. But when you talk about organizations, and it's in particular organizations that truly rely on their data, the numbers are significantly higher. The percentage of companies that actually end up paying all or some of the ransom is very, very high. So 70%, that's a number from the FBI. It actually, if, you're, if we want to be uh, nitpicking, it's actually related to U.S. companies. I don't have the, st the statistics worldwide, but it's a good indication of, of how many people actually end up paying. And if you think they're paying small money, because you've heard that per incident you're paying maybe $300, $500 in Bitcoin. These are, these are not small numbers when we're talking about organizations. In fact, uh, more than half of them paid in excess of $10,000 per incident. That's a high number. And 20% of them pay more than $40,000. So again, a very high number. 
These are not small numbers as we see with individuals. And I even have an example from just um, a couple of weeks ago of a South Korean web hosting company that actually negotiated down the ransom. It was 4.4 million that they were asked to pay. They actually negotiated it down to 1 million, just 1 million. And the guy was saying, I'm now broke. Everything I worked for my entire life is gone. So these numbers are really, really high because the attackers, the cyber criminals, know how much we all rely on our data. And if the data is gone, the business is gone. So they know that they can request high sums when they're talking about organization. And by the way, that's one of the shifts that we're seeing. We're seeing more attacks now targeting organizations rather than individuals. Here's another number for you. In 2016, again, according to FBI estimates, more than $1 billion was paid as ransom. Paid. The damages, by the way, at least tenfold, if not more. Probably like a hundredfold. Because for every company, uh, even when you're paying, there's a lot of uh, downtime, a lot of um, damage to your company that you need to deal with. So if we're, we're trying to estimate a damage, it's in the many, many billions of dollars to the industries. And if we're talking about how much money the um, attackers are making, more than $1 billion. So really, really staggering numbers just in ransomware alone. We're not talking about the rest of the cybercrime world. Is this $1 billion in Bitcoin? Most of it is Bitcoin, yes. Probably like the vast, vast, vast majority would be in Bitcoin. We'll get to Bitcoin in a second. So let's look a little bit about the history of ransomware. So first of all, we need to know, I don't know if you guys know it, but ransomware is actually nothing new. Ransomware as a concept of making money out of cybercrime has been around since 1989. Really, really old time. We think of ransomware as something new. It's not. Except in 1989, this is how ransomware looked like. And again, I like to look at the room and think how many people here are old enough to even recognize what this is. <laughs> uh, this is a five and a quarter disk, uh, inched disk. This is how we used to work with computers in the very old days. Uh, you would put it into your uh, floppy drive uh, and it would load uh, software off of it. And if you happen to receive this floppy uh, disk and put it in your, uh, in your drive and load it, what would happen is that it would uh, encrypt your master boot record, at which point it would have this note appear on your screen asking you to pay uh, money in order to get your data back. Now there are several things that are different about it than what we see today. First of all, the form, uh, the, the delivery mechanism. Of course, this can only scale to whatever number of floppy disks that you can create. In this case, they've created tw about 20,000 of them and sent them, physically sent them in envelopes to unsuspecting people uh, and hoping some of them would actually turn it on and get infected. The second thing is how do you collect the money? In 1989, mechanisms for collecting ransom money were not as uh, effective as they are today and in fact what you were asked to do in this case is send money to a post office box in Panama. Now that post office box if somebody was trying they would figure out who owns it and then they would get back to you. So there would be attribution to who's the criminal. So this is not a very effective way and this is why we haven't seen ransomware proliferate since 89 till um, only a couple a few years ago but the concept was invented a long time ago. So here are the things that have changed. And I've mentioned a few of them. This is how ransomware looks like today, of course. The first thing that changed is the delivery mechanism. We no longer send en envelopes. We have much more effective mechanisms to infect computers. And if we've seen anything in those past uh, couple of attacks, the WannaCry and the Petya from two days ago, is that the delivery mechanism, if you're using a good tool, wow, the sky's the limit. Tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of machines infected within minutes because our mechanisms using either worms or using um, all sorts of uh, tools that allows us to, uh, using credential theft and allowing us to uh, laterally move within the network are much more effective than they've ever been. And even the initial infection point is much more effective than it's been in the past because I can send from my, I can sit in my home in Korea, in Russia, in uh, name a country that's known to have a, a very uh, sophisticated cybercrime industry and send it from there to the rest of the world, worldwide infection within seconds coming out of a single computer in somewhere on the globe. I don't need to physically get to anyone and I can deliver it to millions of people immediately. So the delivery mechanism makes a huge difference in terms of our ability to reach unsuspecting quote-unquote customers. The second thing that changes the importance of data. 
1989, data was used as either backup, sometimes you would use it to do some accounting, you used it to do several things, but more often than not, you had a physical backup, you had other means to, to uh, make sure that uh, it's not lost, and not everything was digitized come back uh, to 2017, every company, every individual in the world has data that they absolutely have to have. If it's an individual, it's the pictures of their kids from their kindergarten. They have to have them. They cannot lose them. They would be devastated if they lost them. And if it's a company, it's the entire company infrastructure that's digitized. Everything from the customer's database, from the track records, from the financial uh, aspects of the company, everything is in digital data. And if you lose access to that data, you really lose your business. You can sometimes recover from, from backup. That's a very costly procedure as well. So the importance that we all place on data is significantly higher in 2017 than it used to be in the old days. And that means that we have more mo motivation to get our data back, even if it means paying the ransom. And the third part leads me to a question that was asked here, is the payment system. Again, I said before, in 1989, post office books box in Panama. Traceable and not very scalable also. Here's what we have um, now. So let's look again at how do you collect ransom fee. And actually, this is a clip that shows, and you probably won't be able to hear it. OK. We'll give it a try. This is how the, we used to collect ransom fees in the old days. If you've ever seen a movie or a TV show where somebody was kidnapping some, somebody and asking for ransom in return, this is how it looked. Now, have you got all the money? Yeah, you can't hear it. <laughs> 2.2 million dollars in unmarked, non-sequential bills. You miserable, scum-sucking thing! Oh, honey, I'm so sorry. They made me say that. Well, these are the key elements here, whether you were able to, to hear her or not. Uh, unmarked, non-sequential bills. This is what used to spell risk-free payments. Meet me at some random place. I will wear uh, something, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, a ski mask to cover my face or something like that. And please bring me a suitcase full of unmarked, non-sequential bills, meaning money that cannot be traced back. Money that I can later use without having it be, uh, be traced back to me. This is what risk-free payments used to look like in the old world. Now, in the new world, we no longer rely on suitcases. We have a much better alternative in the modern world. We use the true power of Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin is very often also now in the news, and people try to tell us that Bitcoin is a legitimate currency. It can be used to do good things, and that is probably true. You can buy legitimate goods with Bitcoin. It's a currency like any other. Um, you can also do the same, by the way, with cash. You can use cash to buy uh, anything that you want in the world, except we kind of all know that if you look down into what cash is truly used for, anytime there is a transaction that involves a large sum of money in cash, usually the reasons are not very legitimate. There is something shady in the background. Otherwise, why are you using cash? Why are you trying to make it untraceable? Same applies to Bitcoin. Bitcoin can be used for legitimate reasons, but more often than not, it's used for things that are not legitimate. So it's used for uh, all sorts of crime. Drug industry, drug trafficking today relies very heavily on the use of Bitcoin behind the scenes. And cybercrime relies on Bitcoin. This is the currency of choice. We see actually uh, additional digital currencies uh, kind of coming, uh, also uh, becoming more popular, but Bitcoin still rules. Uh, and this is what people use it for. It's untraceable and it allows me to have anonymized transactions, the key thing for what you need if you want to do cybercrime, if you want to do crime that involves money that wouldn't be traced to you. So it's heaven for criminals. Uh, it also allows me the convenience of the payment from my victims. Direct online payments by our customers, our victims. They can just go online and pay me. They don't need to go anywhere. It's very convenient, meaning more people are likely to, to do that. They have a very high motivation to pay. We already said that. They, everybody relies very heavily on their data, so they're very likely to pay. And here's the last point that's very interesting. They also have very low motivation to actually involve law enforcement agencies. Well, that's an interesting point, and I want to talk a little bit more about it. What about law enforcement? Because when there's crime in the world, our go-to person, if somebody goes into a, breaks into your house, you go to the police. 
and you expect them to investigate it and to figure out what went wrong and maybe even catch the criminal at the end of the day. That's your expectation. That's everyone's expectation around the world in most countries anyway. But when you get hit with ransomware, with any other cybercrime, somehow the vast majority of those crimes are never reported. And it's not because people are not hurting by it, it's because they, don't th they think it's futile. Who would I report it to? What would they ever do? Why would I even bother? Nobody's reporting cybercrime almost uh, around the world. And another thing that we see is that for every uh, cyber criminal that gets caught, 10,000 go free. Basically, nobody's chasing them. And for everyone that is caught and is successfully prosecuted, the courts are also very uh, forgiving. And about 100 of them will, go, uh, will get off. One maybe will go to prison. Look at the prisons uh, around the world. How many cyber criminals do you think are sitting there? Compare that to the number of attacks that we see. We see uh, um, you know, dozens of attacks on each company every hour. How come nobody's looking for these criminals? These are criminals. They're doing criminal things. They're trying to get to steal money. They're trying to, uh, to, to create vandalism. And nobody's chasing after them. So the reasons nobody's chasing after them is because we're really kind of helpless in that space. Fighting international crime, and most of cybercrime is international. The vast, vast, vast majority of, is, of it is international. It requires international law. It requires international police and international courts. And all of these bodies, first of all, they have very limited resources. And second of all, they move really, really slow. Cybercrime industry moves light speed, fast. Police, courts, laws. These are very, very slow processes. They take years to establish. And by the time you start uh, thinking, OK, I need to create this law that would cover this particular incident, criminals are you know, years ahead of you by the time that law will pass. So it's almost impossible with today's meth method for the, um, for the law enforcement agencies to fight cybercrime. And the result of that is this. In the physical world, we expect our governments to protect us. And in the cyber world, we need to defend ourselves. This is what happens. And this is what we see worldwide. We see everywhere. We see governments funding cyber companies. We see cyber companies trying to offer solutions to customers to defend themselves. But ultimately, we see uh, absolutely uh, zero, I wouldn't say zero, but close to zero uh, protection coming from the government themselves because they're helpless, because they're really not up for the, to the task. So that's a very sad statement about the, the cyber crime in the uh, world today. We hope this would change. but reality of it is they won't, probably won't change in the near term. Okay, I want to go back to uh, how cyber criminals are making money. One more element that allows them to make sure that they're making a lot of money is excellence in customer care. It's kind of funny to talk about customer care when you're talking about criminals, but really they have things like a 24-7 hotline, things like ticketing systems, uh, things like uh, tiered support. That means that if the person assigned to help you is not uh, able to deal with the, um, is not capable of handling your complex situation, but you really want to pay money, there will be somebody more superior, more senior than him that will call you up and help you make sure that the payment goes through. <coughs> so all of these exist, and that, that is because good reputation drives more business. If you get hit by ransomware, the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to go online and you're going to ask yourself, okay, if I pay this ransom, will I get my data back? And if the answer from Google comes back saying, sorry, uh, I paid, I didn't get my data back, and I paid and didn't get my data back, you're probably not very likely to pay. But if the answer comes back, I paid and I got my data back, and somebody even called me up to help me when I had a problem with this one computer, then chances are you're paying, because paying the ransom is often the fastest and the cheapest way to recover. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes the payment is so high that you will try to recover from other means that you have, but very often it's the fastest. So if you have good reputation, it will drive more business for you as a cyber criminal. Okay, so this is what's behind the ransomware plague. As I said, the criminals trying to make money the fastest way from crime to money with all of the, uh, and the uh, risk-free way of making money because nobody's chasing after you, it's untraceable, you can make really good money out of it. I'm not trying to convince you all to go to the dark side and become criminals although some people have heard this presentation in the past and, and thought this might be a good idea. I hope you're not one of them. Uh, so let's uh, try to take uh, a glimpse uh, into the future and, and see what's more to come. 
And we, of course, cannot tell what's more to come, but we can make some predictions based on things that we've started seeing, and we expect them to become more and more, uh, to see them more and more often in the world. So let's look at 2017 and beyond. Some things that we already see, uh, see and extrapolate from them to what we expect to see further. First of all, on the business side, and I mentioned so ransomware is very much a business. We already see ransomware being offered as a service. What does that mean? An affiliation programs that are being created. And anyone who's interested in that, there is a very interesting research on the Checkpoint blog that you can go and read that shows the internals of how um, the criminals are recruiting people to be part of their alliance, part of their affiliation program, offering them revenue sharing options for uh, uh, dealing and distributing the ransomware. One criminal creates a, a strand of ransomware that's very effective very, um, uh, and, and, is, uh, and deals with all the intricacies of how do you penetrate it in the system, how do you encrypt the data, how do you collect the money, and then how do you provide the keys back to the people that pay the money. And then they uh, look for affiliations uh, that would actually distribute it to their quote-unquote customers or acquaintances or people that they are willing to infect. And then they do revenue sharing. I'll take 40% as a vendor, you get 60% of the revenues. And bring a friend, you will get uh, an additional 5 or 15%. Very much working like a business in the uh, legitimate world. It's very much like a business, only in the crime industry. And they're recruiting people actively. Uh, there's a payment model here that we've encountered. Uh, uh, it hasn't picked up so much, we're glad that it didn't, but think of this payment model, how, it, how cruel it actually is. In fact, two of your friends get yours for free. What does that tell, uh, mean? It means that if I get infected by ransomware, I get an offer from the ransomware vendor that says either you pay up the $500 Bitcoin in Bitcoin, or infect two of your friends, I'll give you your keys for free. Now, if I go out and infect two of my friends, they're getting an email from somebody that they know so the chances that they would actually fall victim to that, open that um, attachment and get infected are much higher than if they're getting an email from somebody they've never heard about. And their systems would flag it or they would have uh, the mindset to know, okay, this, is, this looks fishy. But you're getting it from your friend this time. Well, they're not your friends after they said that to you. Uh, but somebody you thought of, of as your friend, so you're not as suspecting and you would open it. So that's kind of the... Uh, thinking behind how do we get more traction, how do we infect more people with this rather cruel payment model that they, uh, they invented on the business side. Let's look a little bit on the, again, quote-unquote, uh, product side. First of all, effective distribution mechanism. And we've seen that, again, uh, over the past few months, and we'll continue to see more and more effective distribution mechanism being invented, being uh, done. Uh, you will hear later about the latest ransomware attack. The distribution mechanism in that case, uh, in, uh, in the case of the suspected, I should say, distribution mechanism for the uh, outbreak that was two days ago, was through penetrating an update server for some software company. You know, all of your softwares today, they, they reach out to a central server by the vendor of that software and get updates all the time. So by accessing and penetrating that um, update server and infecting it with something that is malicious, they were able to, able to plant their malicious software across all of the people that use this software. They didn't even have to go in and infect those uh, different companies. They were just pulling this from the, uh, the server unsuspectingly and get infected. More details on that in the later sessions today. Uh, that's just an example. Of course, more distribution mechanism will continue to uh, we'll continue to see them. Backup, back, uh, encrypting, uh, encryption of the backups. Uh, we already see that today and we expect to see more and more of that. Uh, usually the first thing that people do when they get hit by ransomware after they, when they try to evaluate should I pay the ransom or should I just try to recover, they go to their backups, assuming they have the backups. So if you're a ransomware vendor, the first thing you want to do is make sure that that backup is also not accessible, also encrypted. And if you do that, you increase the chances of those people ending up paying you the ransom, right? So encryption of the backups, and backups can be anything from your shadow copy locally on your Windows system and all the way up to uh, your Google Drive, your Dropbox, anything that you're using online. If I have access to it and I can encrypt the files there as well, I'm increasing the chances that you will pay the ransom back to me. Uh, supporting of additional platforms, of course, we already see these things. They're not as uh, popular as Windows systems, but we already know that uh, ransomware for Mac do exist, 
for all of you people to think I'm using Max, I'm probably immune to it, or Linux, you're not immune at all. You're maybe less likely of a target, but you're not immune. And mobile devices, we'll see more and more of that. The reason we're not seeing more of that is simply because the world of Windows is so wide open and, and um, represents such uh, massive amounts of, of potential revenues that the uh, attackers are not really bothering so much with those other devices just yet. But as soon as uh, they kind of, um, the, the windows will close their loops more and more, we'll see more leaning towards those other platforms. And the last one is the most interesting one, IoT, Internet of Things. Uh, because Internet of Things really represents a huge, huge, huge business potential if you're a cyber criminal. And let's take a look at this a little bit. The Internet of Ransomware Things, as we call it. Uh, your phone, your camera, your watch, your thermostat, your car. And I could go on and on and on. Everything that you choose to connect online for your convenience, for your ability to control. If you're watching TV, you see all those ads showing how you can now turn on your air conditioning while you're driving home, right? Everybody's seen that in Israel. But probably elsewhere as well. That also means that someone else could penetrate those systems. And trust me, those systems are far less secure than we're used to in the computer world. Every Windows system is much more secure than your thermostat on that uh, air conditioning. So imagine a hacker hacking into your uh, thermostat, hacking into your AC uh, device. And now, uh, this is middle of the summer here, I'm going to turn it to 30 degrees. And until you pay me a good sum of money, the, the temperature is not coming down. Think of yourself coming home at the end of a very uh, busy day. Your house is really, really hot. Are you paying $200 or not to get the temperature back? I think you are. And this is true for every one of those devices. Endless business opportunities if you're a cyber criminal. It's not just about encryption. It's about denying you access to systems that you rely on. You connect it online. All of a sudden, it's a business opportunity for a cyber criminal. OK, so that takes me to the last segment of this session. And this is what can we do? Because I've just painted a very dismal picture of criminals using superpower uh, uh, tools and of uh, all of our devices and all of our computers being completely exposed. So what can we do in order to protect ourselves? And the truth of the matter is that despite all of that dismal um, picture I just painted, there is actually a lot that we can do. And let's start off with saying the first obvious thing, educate. Yes, it's true, we cannot rely on education as the single line of defense, but still, if you educate your people not to click on the link, yourselves and your people, if you're an organization, the chances are you will avoid at least some of the attacks. Okay? So you don't have to click on links that you're not familiar with from somebody you've never heard of. And if it looks suspicious, it probably is suspicious. Make sure people are educated about the risks of cyber attack, cyber crime in the world today. But we cannot rely just on that because everybody's absent-minded every once in a while. So here's another thing, backup. That's kind of an obvious thing as well. Because like I said before, when you get hit by ransomware, you have two choices. Pay the ransom and hope that you happen to have been infected by a ransom that actually gives you your data back or uh, restore from backup. Either way, it's going to be costly. Restoring from backup is anything but cheap. It takes a long time. You would usually lose some of your data. Backups tend to fail when you actually need them. That's the reality of things. But still, backing up is a generally good practice for many reasons and also for recovery from ransomware. So don't neglect backups. Here's the, th the third one. And I call it, as a broader term, maintaining IT hygiene. What does it mean to maintain IT hygiene? It's just generally good practices to make sure your organization is secure. Before you buy any security product whatsoever, make sure the latest patches are installed. A lot of the attacks that we've seen recently would have been avoided for any company that it has good patching methodology and actually follows it rigorously. Segment your network. Segmenting your network would not block the attack, but it would block the, the, the fact that it would attack your entire company. There's a very big difference if you know, 20 computers are infected by ransomware or a thousand of them are. So segmenting your network means that you are able to contain an attack if you happen to have been infected. Make sure your networks are not flat. Flat networks are heaven for cyber criminals. Again, this is what we've seen in the latest outbreak. Uh, limit. Uh, when I say limit, I mean limit access to a lot of things. Uh, things like uh, your uh, 
um, super admin password. Don't let every second person have them. Just because somebody calls up a help desk doesn't mean you need to give them the super admin password. You do need to limit them. You do need to make sure that you change them every so often. Because these things do add up, and criminals know that you're not changing your password, and they will find those passwords somewhere. And if you're re reusing the same password everywhere, so we can find your LinkedIn password and then use it to penetrate your account on your corporate network. And close ports that you don't need. And there are many other elements that are kind of known uh, good practices in terms of maintaining your network uh, and your system's uh, security, just by following procedures, maintaining IT hygiene, as we call it. So that's the third one. And if you've done all of that, you're, you're, pretty, uh, you're protected pretty well, but you're, it's still not perfect because, again, the cybercrime industry is very sophisticated day, these days. It's using tools that sometimes you cannot protect against. And that leads me to number four, which is protect yourself. So even though we claim that the cyber criminals are super effective and have means to bypass most of the security controls that uh, we try to put in them, there still are effective technologies that are available and people can buy and can install and can use to protect themselves. So it might not work against the ultra sophisticated zero day attack that we see once every three years and maybe somebody's targeting exactly you. But that's not the vast majority of what we see. For almost everything that we see every day, protection mechanisms that exist in the market today are very effective and will give you the right protection. And you'd think everybody would know that, but the reality is that they're, uh, they're actually not. Most customers today are actually not protected. If we look at advanced threat prevention, the, most, uh, the one that's actually been adopted the most out of the advanced threat prevention uh, for, for your networks and for your endpoints, this is the one that's been mostly adopted, it's still at a dismal 7%. Only 7% of the companies worldwide actually employ mechanisms for advanced threat prevention. Compare that to what is actually happening in the world. When we look at uh, the types of malware that we catch, latest uh, statistics that we see, roughly 40% being catched by antivirus software, the old type of uh, threat prevention, and 60% require advanced threat prevention mechanisms to be caught. So companies that settle for the old baseline threat prevention mechanism are only protected 40% of the time. 60% of the time, they're not protected. So this number seven has to go up. Companies and individuals need to adopt advanced threat prevention. When we're talking about mobile and cloud security, the numbers are even more staggeringly low, and the rest of them are simply not protected. Not protected from the actual attacks and the actual um, things that you need to protect yourself from today. So this is the reality that we see today, and we're working very hard to change it, not just because as a vendor we want to make sure that more people buy our products, but also because we think that people truly do not understand the uh, risks that they are facing in today's modern world. What you often see is a company getting hit by something that they could have protected themselves from, at which point they start calling all of the security vendors in the world, help me, help me, help me. Often it's too late. But they will be prepared for the next time. This is data from uh, our own research, uh, from Checkpoint's research. So advanced threat protection is not the AD and the firewall, but something beyond that? Yes, it's everything that goes beyond the baseline. The baseline threat prevention we consider to be signature-based protections, like antivirus, like IPS, and firewalls, of course. These are the baseline technologies. And we're talking about advanced one, or we're talking about tools that are capable of dynamic analysis, tools that are capable to go deeper into the understanding of what's going on, machine learning capabilities, deep analysis, um, big data analytics, user behavioral analytics, all of those other topics that are considered more advanced and therefore give you uh, better protections. But when we look at the reality, like I said, with the old time uh, protections, you can only catch a very narrow segment of the attacks that we see in the wild today. I'm going to finish with just explaining a little bit about how ransomware gets in and what type of technologies you could use, like I said, the baseline and the advanced technologies. Ransomware gets in pretty much like any other malware, either users downloading malicious documents, browsing infected websites. It gets in through malicious links uh, sent through emails or malicious attachments. Uh, occasionally, you would see a USB with a malicious file that somebody plugs into their uh, endpoint and then it gets infected. And lastly, use of exploits, or in the case that we've just seen, uh, using an update server to make sure 
that we are able to access the endpoint directly and plant our malware uh, proactively on that endpoint or on that server. And we've seen that often in many of the attacks that we've seen. When you look at how ransomware gets in, it becomes uh, obvious how you need to protect from it. You need to protect from it before it gets to the endpoint itself. And then you also want to make sure that if for some reason you weren't able to catch it while it was coming in, you're able to catch it after it reached the endpoint itself. And that's the set of technologies that you need to be looking for, layered protection. And in, in security, in physical security and in cybersecurity, security always has to come in layers. You never rely on a single line of defense. You always want to make sure you have several lines because you know for a fact, and anyone that tells you otherwise, that there isn't a single line that would protect you uh, from everything. Every line came, can be bypassed, but if you put enough of them, you will be protected uh, very well. So we start off with the baseline threat prevention with the IPS and the antivirus, and we move on to more advanced technologies. Uh, and these are technologies that we offer to our customers, technologies that are capable of identifying uh, deceptive websites, technologies that can sanitize files before, before users can actually access them, technologies that do dynamic analysis of files before we allow people to actually open them on their actual endpoint. So that dynamic analysis allows us to understand whether or not they're, being inf uh, they're infective or, uh, infected or not. Technologies that look for command and control activity coming from either the network or the endpoint towards uh, a known command and control server or using known command and control communication. And lastly, we also offer technologies, and you should have technologies that are directly on the endpoint itself, on the server itself, that actually deal directly with things that you can only see on the endpoint. So you try to block it as far away from the asset that you're protecting as much as you can, block it on the way before it gets there, but also put an extra line of defense, think of it as your shelter, uh, on the endpoint itself that also ensures that if, somebody, if something happens to come through, you can still catch it on the endpoint itself before it's able to do its damage. That's my message to you. There is no reason for the next to, to be a victim. Tools are available. Protections are available. People need to be more minded to it. People need to know how uh, to know that they need to use them and to protect themselves. All of those four uh, points that I made before and the last of them, use the right protection tools, defeat cybercrime. Thank you very much. <laughs>